All right, here we go. So I just want to say thank you so much for having me today. I've been very nervous and very freaked out. I've done a couple of talks this year and I didn't feel this nervous. There's something about speaking to peers who are doing something similar that really heightens expectations. So uh, please bear with me. It's, it's, it's extremely a great privilege to be here and um, we'll, see. we'll see how it goes. Um, <laughs> inspirational talks aren't cool here, so I'll just get that piece over with, over and done with. I guess the TLDR, if you want to leave now, is uh, stick with it, be true to your values, and Mark, <laughs> look after yourself, folks. So, like any good story, and microconf, it begins in Vegas. I'm lying in bed, Basically, pretty hungover. Over here, we have Des Trainer, who you may know as the, the co-founder of Intercom. And on the floor is a co-founder of the company we'd started together, Dave Rice. In the next room is Owen McCabe, the now CEO of Intercom, and he had kicked Dave out during the night for whatever he wanted to use the room for. So, we're in Vegas for RailsConf. Great conference, 08, really good conference. We were shipping a product that we had built for the Rails market, and we had, we had gotten there through a grant from a company or a, an organization called Enterprise Ireland, which provides money for startups um, to do cool things. So they had sent us there. So we're in Vegas, we're selling the product, and it's my last day. Des is snoring, Dave is passed out, I don't know what Owen is doing, and I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? So I checked Twitter, and a guy called John Larkovsky, who is working at Hashrocket, who, which is a pretty kind of renowned Rails uh, company at the time, he is doing a thing called LarkConf, which is basically the lobby, the hallway track of RailsConf. And he's put it out there. He's seen on the O'Reilly app that, you, that some people want to meet him. So he, he tweeted everybody, and he says, meet at 9 a.m. in the lobby for LarkConf. So I go along to LarkConf. And I meet a whole bunch of really interesting people, um, even some really long-term friendships. But one in particular was a guy called Randall Thomas, who was working at Engine Yard at the time. Engine Yard at the time, the coolest Rails company. So I was like, oh, this is amazing. Randall and I chat about food. We're getting on really well. And he says, hey, well, we basically strike up a friendship, and we end up in a bar that night. And he says, Paul, what are you doing for the next few days? So it's my last day at Contrast. The plan was for them to plan the future of the company without me in it. I don't know what I was supposed to be doing for those few days, maybe going to Alcatraz or something. So Randall says, what are you doing for the next few days? And I say, <laughs> nothing. And he says, well, I'm going up upstate with a few friends in the next few days to do some cooking. And I think, geez, OK, that's good. I mean, I'm not doing anything. All right, OK. And I say, listen, Randall, I'm going to square with you. I don't do drugs. So Randall says, no, no, Paul, you got, you got it wrong. We're literally going to be cooking food. <laughs> and so I said, well, that sounds cool. So the next day, I'm in a BMW M3 driving up the Sonoma coast with Rob Mee, the CEO of then Pivotal Labs, Randall, and the woman that Randall was looking to entertain that weekend. It's just me and Rob. Basically, I, Randall brought me to look after Rob. And so... It was the start of my journey, and it was this, and the reason I want to draw attention to this prequel story, and I'm going to spend a bit of time in the prequel, is exactly what Rob said yesterday. That three years before I even wrote a line of code in Tito, I was sort of accidentally, but also intentionally, going out and meeting people, meeting the extraordinary people, and within two degrees of going, coming to a conference, as you all have, and meeting literally the son of the guy that invented magnetic tape at IBM. So, so that was cool. Working. So, <laughs> a few years later, I go to another conference. It was JSConf EU. The JavaScript community was pretty nascent, but I was pretty lucky. I got onto a, a rising wave going to the first conference. There were superstars of the JavaScript community in the, wor in the world. I hadn't met the likes of Thomas Fuchs and Amy Hoy. They were there. I got to meet them in person. Douglas Crockford was there. John Resig was there. And I did something pretty simple. I put out a tweet, or maybe I said it to somebody. I said, hey, if there are any folks who do Ruby programming, do you want to go for dinner tonight? And I expected maybe Amy and Thomas and one other to come. 18 people came for pizza that night, including John Resick, who I had the most awkward conversation with about TV shows. Like, why do I say I'm just a little nerdy Irish guy from Ireland? This guy's the inventor of jQuery. So, 
But it happened, and it sort of gave me a little bit of an insight that, like, if you, it doesn't take a whole lot to invite people to dinner. And one of the organizers of the conference, Jan Leonard, who I had met in Dublin the previous year, I guess he saw something in that, because at the after party of the event, he comes to me and says, hey, Paul, Paul, the GitHub guys are coming. I'm exhausted. Paul, could you look after them? And, like, the whole, my hole opens up around me. The GitHub, it launched in 2008, this is 2009. I'm like, this is the coolest thing you could possibly imagine and the founders are coming, are gonna be here. Not 45 minutes later, I'm chatting to Scott Chacon, one of the co-founders of GitHub over a beer, Tom Preston Warren is CEO and PJ Hyatt is standing there. Um, we're, we're chatting away, we're getting on because we do Ruby programming, we're getting on because we, we share similar interests. It was extraordinary. So I, <laughs> um, we go to another bar, we're shooting pool together. It's just extraordinary and it's totally normal. How is this normal is what I'm thinking. We stay out all night drinking um, and we get back to bed at 7 o'clock. It was amazing. Friends with the GitHub folks. A couple months later, I'm at RubyConf and I gave a talk and I was feeling pretty lonely and it was in San Francisco and I didn't really know what I was doing. And Tom was there and I walk up to Tom and like, hey Tom, and he looks at me like I'm a piece of dirt in the floor and I'm like, okay, maybe it's not that easy but I kept at it. One of the things that I said to Scott when we first met was an idea that I had with a friend who had been to JSConf to, to organize a conference to bring people to Ireland, to bring web people, interesting people that we'd met at all these conferences to Ireland. And Scott said, I'd love to come. I said, do I go to a fun conference? We're thinking of doing a fun conference in Ireland. He'd say, I'd love to come to a fun conference in Ireland. And so a couple of weeks later, I was sitting with Eamon, and I was describing the experience that I had after meeting Tom at RubyConf. Basically, a coach arrived outside of RubyConf and brought all of us around startup offices in San Francisco. And it was a really cool idea. So I said this to Amy. I said, I don't want a conference that's just cloth back, seat in a, cloth back seats in a conference center somewhere. I want something remarkable, memorable, different, exciting. Um, and he said, well, why, based on, this, on the bus thing, he said, let's hire the party bus. The party bus is like a, a stupid bus that you can hire for stag dues and bachelor parties and things like that. It's got a stage up the front, limousine seating, and you can, put, you can put beers into it. But we put out a website saying the first ever technology conference on a bus um, where we would trail through the Irish countryside and stop off. And, and people were into it. People came and people, uh, people came. Tom agreed to come and speak. Uh, Michael Lopp, who was at Apple and then went on to become lots of different things, and he's now the VP of engineering at Slack, he came. And then through Twitter and through the grapevine, Werner Vogels, who's the CTO at Amazon.com, he decided to come and drink Guinness in the Irish countryside, because why not? So it was extraordinary. And the reason I want to spend so much time on that is that, I, um, well, this was about when I was starting Tito, but the first one, Tito didn't exist, and I'd already spent so much time getting to know conferences and getting to know people. So around about the same time, I was consulting, I was building web apps for people for money, as I'm pretty sure everyone here has done or is still doing. Um, and I was going through another founder separation. So things didn't work out with the contrast folks, and that's why I'm not an intercom billionaire. And things, again, weren't working out with my co-founder at HyperTiny. Um, we had been approached by a firm for an acquisition. So um, we kind of waited it out, it took a long time. When the acquisition offer came in, it came in over Skype. And it was, again, it was all through the conference network. And the, the offer came in, it was like, we want to pay you 800,000 euros. And I'm like, woohoo! <laughs> over the next two years, okay, that's interesting, split as salaries between the two of you, okay, 400k each, 200 salary, uh, with a base salary and then a bonus system based on performance. And I'm like, okay, acquisition, 800k, okay, interesting. Wait, hold on. This is a job offer. I don't want a job. <laughs> so I turned it down and the other guy took it. But for the second FunConf, I had been to a conference and uh, it was build. It was basically the same kind of thing. And one of the reasons I started FunConf was because build existed. It was Andy McMillan, the guy who now runs XOXO Fest, the creative festival in, Port in Portland. He basically said to me, or he didn't say anything to me, although we had met. <laughs> he the, the buying tickets for Bill the second, time, second year round was you clicked on a link and it said buy tickets. Then you paid on PayPal and then you had tickets. For all the other conferences that I'd gone to, you sort of had to share your life story before you even saw a credit card form. And I was like, this build conference purchasing process, every conference ought to be like that. And so 
That was why I started Tito. At the very start, Tito was just a simple API wrapper between our website and PayPal. All right, you clicked on buy tickets, you go into PayPal, and you came back, you had tickets. It was a Ruby on Rails API app on Heroku. There was no admin dashboard. There was no UI. There was no check or checkout UI. And in order to see who was coming to the conference, I had to check the Rails console. <laughs> Bit of a nerdy, nerdy story. Um, and then I'll keep coming back to FunConf, because at FunConf was a guy called Horace Dedio. He runs a Simco.com, which is a, a consultancy blog, a mobile web consultancy blog. And he came to me after FunConf Fun Fun and said, hey, Paul, I want to run my own conference. Can you help? And I was like, well, we've got this piece of software. Do you want to use it? And he said, yeah. So that, we built our first checkout experience for him. Um, Horace was friends with Michael Rogers, who was also at FunConf. Michael came because of Horace, and Michael was running NodeConf. Um, Michael basically said, hey, I'll use Tito. Um, he used Tito, and then promptly we oversold his event, and then, of course, we had to implement overselling logic. Uh, Michael was friends with Chris, who was also at FunConf, and Chris was friends with Jan and the gang, who were also at FunConf. So all of doing all of this was how we got our initial customers. Now, U0, that all happened before we actually launched the product. Through that little network, we processed over a million euros in ticket sales. We didn't make anything because... Uh, Stupidly, I didn't think that the product was actually valuable to anybody. And we, had, we, got, we got about 75 initial users, literally through that, people knowing people, knowing people who knew the interesting people who came to FunConf. And so that's really the main theme, or the, the grand zero, the baseline takeaway, if you learn nothing else. And I think that's pretty much the, we all agree that that's why we're here, is that relationships are everything. Everything good that I've done since is, is about relationships. And that's why I think it's so important to, one, consider it, and two, talk about it for so much of a foundation story, because nothing else after that really mattered. So <laughs> the next part of what I want to talk about is just the story of, of how we got from 2013 all the way to where we are now with uh, a bit of, bit of money in a real business. So. At the end of 2012, inspired by Travis CI, they had raised 120,000 euro in a crowdfunding campaign. People don't make that money, much money sometimes in seed rounds, so a crowdfunding campaign seemed like a really good way to get independent money. We said we wanted to get 60K, 5K, 12 customers who we'd put on our website, and they would get free service for a year, and then 1% or 1 euro rates thereafter. It worked. We made about 50 grand, which was great. We didn't have to implement a billing system or anything. Um, the problem was we weren't explicit about that year cliff. And so to my knowledge of the 12 customers, some of them don't run their events anymore, but of the 12 customers, none of them paid us a red cent since. And I don't know how much money we've left on the table because of that. That was kind of just like, whatever. So a bit of a mistake. So we really should have been explicit about that up front. One of those customers was the Web Summit. <laughs> and not being explicit about that, you can imagine how many potential hundreds of thousands have been left on the table out of that. It led to years of arguing, years of arguing, that only got resolved last summer. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll come back to that. So uh, the crowdfunding campaign was, was great, but we really gave too much away. Another interesting thing at the time was that we didn't have a billing engine built, but we wanted to onboard some non-founding customers. So we had a checkout built that had a Stripe integration, so we just put up an event called Tito Introductory Customers that allowed us to accept money from people. And in order to join Tito at the start and be a paying customer, you had to buy a ticket to the Introductory Customers event, and we were able to onboard customers that way. So that was cool. I thought that was quite creative. So 2013, um, we didn't make much money through any kind of formal billing process, but we did the crowdfunding. We had a few introductory customers, but we, we processed a, a hefty chunk of, of money on behalf of other people. Um, but we definitely we gave too much away, and that was because I really still thought about it as a toy at the time. I really just I, I, I didn't take it seriously as a business, and I feel like I ought to have. So the next year, things started to get a little bit serious. So. We started, we had our billing engine built and we started to take on real revenue. And to be perfectly honest, and it's a bit of a weird feeling as a developer, a lot of the code that we wrote in 2014 forms the basis of what we're still serving to customers now, six years later. I'm still a little bit embarrassed to admit that. Um, and we've, we've made a few mistakes. We hired this guy, uh, Killian, or Kilbo as I affectionately 
refer to him. And I started another conference. Um, it's not, I don't want to say too much about that. It was called Ool. It was a conference for Apple enthusiasts. But by starting that conference, it created the same network spiral that FunConf did. And if you go to WWDC, which is Apple's official conference, if you go to any of the sideline events, there are six or seven. There's AltConf and Daring Fireball and these pieces. They all do their ticketing through Tito because of that conference. So it can happen. It, it really works. And, and people want to use tools that are built by people they know. As long as they're good, like you have to get the tech right. This year we made our first mistake, which was to, uh, it, the branch was called Doc is Away. It was a little joke. Doc is my co-founder. His Twitter handle is DRB Parsons. And when he used to go to conferences, people thought he was Dr. B Parsons. Um, but no, like he's a business analyst from, from Bournemouth or somewhere. <laughs> so Doc went on holiday and we said, let's, let's, change from Bootstrap 2 to Bootstrap 3 because it was going to make building the app so much easier in, these, uh, in the three weeks that he was away. <laughs> the doc is away. When he came back, we changed it to doc is in. It's funny, whatever. And it didn't ship until 12 months later in March of 2015. Um, we also started making more money because the, the, the organic kind of treadmill continued on, um, and we started transitioning from a side project. I hired Killian full-time, and he was able to work in the design, and he just was basically full-time. And I think that's part of the reason why we have so much code left over from that year, because there was a certain amount of focus. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> So I hired him full time, but transitioning Doc was much harder because he was older, he was starting a family, he was married, he had a mortgage, um, and that just led to a, re a lot of inner tension because um, Doc was doing work, but he wasn't necessarily charging for it, and we would say, oh, we'll just sort that out, we can do a shareholding arrangement later, I'll be interested in taking some equity. Such a bad idea! Such a bad idea, we should have sorted all of that out up front, and it wasn't until the following year that we, we managed to do it. So. It was really, really hard transition. Um, the other part of transitioning from consulting to a product work is that you really just want to work on the product, and so you're not doing the best job you can for your, your clients. I sort of feel maybe if I was to go back and do it again, um, I wouldn't make that mistake, and i just do a bunch of work, put a bunch of money in the bank, and then go at it with, with focus full time. So, oh, there's all the 2015 money. So 2015 was the year that... Uh, <laughs> it was the year that Kilbo left us, and uh, I'll remember him fondly. He, he basically got sick of the tension between Doc and me. Um, and <laughs> the, story, the story goes, or the, the, the anecdote that I'll fondly remember was one night we were all working late in the office, and we were ordering dinner in, and I say, oh, hey, do you want to get sushi? And Doc, said, Doc doesn't really like fish, but he says, I only eat sushi off the backs of naked virgins. And like, it took a moment to sink in, and then Kel Kilbo just kind of t did a wry smile, and he says... I'll just take my clothes off then. <laughs> but 2015, we shipped Doc is in, the, the, the long running branch that took a year when it was only supposed to take three weeks. Uh, we shipped that and it sort of came to a sense of calm. We saw our biggest quarter growth ever, 150% in the second quarter. We, we had that shipped so we didn't have all these branches running. We were, were operating on a single code base. Still only four of us in the company. And things just felt like they were coming to a head. We hit 20K, 20K in MRR. So that was the time that I kind of, the target that I had internally set for, okay, it's now time to get serious and time to grow up and time to, to assign shares and divvy up the company. It just led to a summer of total tension, arguments, nastiness between Doc and me, and um, I'd left it way too late to have those awkward conversations. There was, uh, there was conversations about who brings more value to the business, which have no place in divvying out shareholding, because shareholding has no relation to the value you bring to the business. It's just a number. Um, I, I, we should have sorted that out from day one. On the other hand, what we did get right was the incorporation process. I hired a big legal firm. They took care of it for me. Uh, I brought in a friend from school who, was, who had an accounting background, and he, managed, he agreed to manage all the books. So the books were squeaky clean. Like We started off on an absolute blank slate. We had a great set of legal documents. We hired a secretarial firm to file legal filings for us. So we've never missed an annual return, and everything has been really above board, and all of the shareholding got done really well. So that was something that I came out of the ashes of the complete disaster of not dealing with things up front, we got the, the boring bits right. 
Um, despite everything else, we, we doubled revenue roughly um, and started to process a, bunch, a whole bunch more. Quite skewed by the Web Summit, but that just kind of rolled on. So 2016 ought to have been like the hockey stick great success after such a good year in 2015. But actually, for a number of reasons, it was a brick wall year. Um, my wife was pregnant. We were buying a house. Uh, <laughs> a couple of months after the baby was born, I decided, I don't know what kind of crazy, I decided to go and do Doc is in again. So I was like, I'm just going to re-implement. And then it was, it was literally bootstrap four again. I decided to re-implement our whole admin dashboard. But even worse, I decided to re-implement our checkout again. And I swear to God, I promise you, and I hate myself for it. It's 2019. And the two projects I started back in 2016, they haven't shipped yet. So Peldi, I know exactly what you mean when they say things slip. It's such a cause of embarrassment, and it was a huge mistake to do that so naively without even just thinking about it. But a couple of other interesting things did. I think had these things not happened, we'd be dead by now. At the end of 2015, a random Twitter user called Usher the App that didn't even have a name on it said, hey guys, I really like your stuff. Um, I'd love to meet for a chat. So we, I think he left maybe his mobile number or something. We gave it a call or an email, and it's this guy called Carl. Carl had built Usher, which was a kind of an invitation app and been acquired by a competitor. He was their Dublin office, and he was interested in coming to work at Tito. He basically said, I'm about to renew my contract with this company, and I need to make a decision in a week. What can you offer me to come and join as a commercial guy? And I'm thinking, this guy, I really want to hire this guy now, and there's a great sense of urgency. I think he could be a good sales and marketing hire for our company. So we did hire him. We didn't go through any hiring process. As I've learned now, we probably should have, but there you go. Carl got himself a good job. But around about the same time, one of our biggest customers who was about to be acquired said, we're about to come into money, and we want to buy some shares in Tito. All that stuff in my life was happening. Doc was also having a kid, getting mortgaged. Even though we were making money, we just didn't have enough cash to pay the bills. The tax man was starting to sniff, and there was a sheriff's letter. It was like really, really stressful. And this guy came along and said, basically the deal was 300,000 for, at a 10 million valuation. So 300K for 3% 3 of the business. And I'm thinking, that's an offer I can't refuse. However, <laughs> Um, the, the check, the final check. So Enterprise Ireland basically are an Irish company that will match funding. So I have my 300K. They will do up to 250K in the first round. They basically have said yes. This is the summer of 2016. The check arrived the day before Christmas Eve 2017. It took 21 months from the initial commitment of 300K to get what amounted to... Basically, at one point, I had a million committed, and the, the end result was 565k. The initial guy, he basically, at the end of the process, he said he could only do uh, 40k because he wasn't able to write it off against tax because we were an Irish company, not a UK company. There was another person who said they could give us 250,000 if they had three months, and we were like, no, we need to close in June 2016, even though it didn't close until there. <laughs> he said, um, and he said, so 250k for here, or 50k now. We said, we'll take 50k now. I emailed him in September, and he's like, oh, sorry. No, we don't have that anymore. It was just a total, total, total shit show. Um, and it was a distraction. It was a huge distraction. And basically for, all, for that whole time, um, stuff got in the way. But the beauty of having Carl around was that Carl had a pedigree. So he was able to fill in the forms. He was able to kind of do the spreadsheets and all the documents required to get the Enterprise Ireland money. So it was a real asset. So, um, and it also allowed Doc and me to focus on the ridiculously long-running projects. So... Despite everything, despite the mess, despite life getting in the way, uh, and it really did, we still continued to grow. We grew about 40% uh, that year. Um, and we're still increasing the amount of revenue we're processing. So 2017 and 2018 are a bit of a blur for me, and I'm not really sure what happened. I guess anyone who is a parent of, of kids who don't sleep might understand what I'm talking about. And it, it felt like we shipped nothing. It felt like we did nothing. But we did have a bunch of money in the bank because 
we'd sell these shares. So I started looking toward balancing the team out, both on, uh, I felt that we were too engineering heavy and I felt that we should be focusing on sales and marketing commercial activities. So we hired a person out of HubSpot because for the first six months of that year, we didn't publish a single blog post. That's how distracted we were. We couldn't even publish a single blog post. So she came in and our blog has been really, really active and alive. And so to the outside world, it feels like we're alive even though we haven't shipped anything in two years. We also hired somebody from Eventbrite, which seemed like a really good idea. She was a community manager at Eventbrite, and she has helped us to build an events strategy, which I think is going to be really, really important for us. Um, I just can't think of any anything else that happened that year, which is so, so tragic. So we had all these opportunities, and I just can't think of it. But we still continue to grow. So the numbers, the process number is going up, our revenue is going up 30% again, um, and the only thing I can think of is that as soon as we took our gas off the shipping pedal, Carl, Annie, Maria, they were out there just doing marketing stuff, and it's, it's, a, it's a message that you've heard over and over again at this conference, and it really did work for us. We continued to grow despite it being ridiculously crazy and unorganized in the background. So 2018 rolled around, and because we needed another distraction, GDPR hit, and we had to be super ready. So we turned it into an opportunity. We produced a really beautifully illustrated guide, um, and he did the research in that, and that got us a, a huge amount of credit as a kind of an expert in the space. And uh, we sort of unraveled the GDPR mystery for a lot of people, and we ran a bunch of events, meetups, customer dinners, those kind of things. So. The benefits of those kind of things were that um, we got to meet the customers that we hadn't been paying attention on whilst we were distracted by these two long-running projects. We got to show them some of the behind the scenes, and people were getting excited and giving us real feedback that we were on the right track. So running the events was, was really, really uh, empowering for me. We also we got a nice new office, and we did murals, and we did a lot of things that were kind of investing in the team, I guess. Um, but again, the year just slipped away from us. One thing we did was decide to run a conference because I felt that I knew how to run a conference from all the, all the experience years gone by. To cut a long story short, we announced the conference in June of last year and it was maybe going to be on in November. We found ourselves around this time, the start of October, the conference was on in three weeks. We had booked out a beautiful 300 capacity artisan venue in, in Chicago. We sold 20 tickets. So it was an impending embarrassment, let alone a disaster. So the choice was whether we would cancel it or fess up and try and make something good of it. So we felt that canceling it would basically diminish all, any money that we'd spent already on deposits and things. So we, tried to, we cut out all the deposits we'd sent. We emailed the speakers and said, listen, this has happened. One pulled out, so that was fine. We still had a speaker lineup. And we emailed all the attendees and we said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a mystery tour. We're going to change the venue. We haven't sold enough tickets for that venue. We're going to send a car to your hotel in the morning, and we're going to do a mystery tour. And I think we said something like, do you like coffee and do you like boats? And that was the only teaser that we gave of the day. Um, the car showed up at their hotel, brought them to an, uh, a private coffee morning at Intelligentsia Coffee Roasters and a private tour of the roastery. There was tea too. Uh, Actually, interesting. No, it's okay. <laughs> I was just going to say that uh, T2 reminded me that the actual official pronunciation of Tito is supposed to be T2 because it's tickets to. Get it? Anyway, <laughs> back to admission. Um, there was T2. Um, we bust everybody to a lofted apartment that, was, that served as the venue, and there was a big screen. And it was even too big for the tiny numbers, but it was a really intimate, cozy event. It was like being in someone's... Literally, it was someone's living room we hosted the conference. After the event, we bust everybody to the Chicago River, and we had a beautiful, scenic, architectural cruise down the river, and then we brought everybody back where we had reset the room into a private dining room with a personal chef and a five-course meal. And it really was, it was, we tried to turn a disaster into something extraordinary. It cost us a lot of money. It was basically, cutting the loss cost basically the last of, our, of the investment money, so it was an expensive mistake for us. But I think what it did was it really kind of set us out and it really showed people what we're about as a company, that we really care about getting things right. We care about quality and excellence. We care about bringing a smile and fun and, and, and whimsy in what we do. So it, it sent a strong message. And we were able to use the videos for marketing collateral. And so maybe it wasn't completely a, a sunk cost. But um, I feel like we definitely saved it. And I think that we've 
we, the next time we do it, we will be able to learn from the mistakes. We didn't market it earlier. We didn't set the value prop right. Maybe we didn't get the pricing right. Maybe we didn't build up enough of a community ahead of time. There's so many things that we could do better. Um, and despite all of the craziness, we still managed to grow by about 30% that year. Um, <laughs> There's an anecdote that I want to share. I guess I'm too, I'm, you might be anecdoted out. But just before I go into the, the, the last year, um, <laughs> maybe I won't. Do you remember, uh, do you remember back when, when we did FunConf for the first time um, and Werner came to FunConf? The bit that I missed was that FunConf was, it had to be delayed. So just like the admission story, the week that we had planned FunConf, the, the volcano in Iceland erupted, the Eyjafjallajökull Eyjafjall Eyjafjall volcano. And so it was, it was, this was Monday, and FunConf was supposed to be on Friday, and we had to make a decision whether to postpone on the Tuesday. Um, and we did, we had to postpone. But some people, were, they flew in anyway. We had a little meetup in Dublin. And then Werner, who's the CTO at Amazon, he says, hey, come and, uh, do you, if you want to spend a, a, a Queen's Day on my boat in Amsterdam. And we're like, whoo. What would you do if the CTO of the, one of the biggest companies in the world invited you to spend a day in his personal boat on, his, on the national holiday of his country? So we went, and, uh, and this is how you build, build a network. So we found ourselves in Amsterdam. The Queen's Day is, is on the canals in Amsterdam, but we were, stay, we were staying across the water, and so we had to go on this boat over to the canal, and in the boat were a couple of Werner's friends and Tom Preston Werner from, from GitHub and his wife. Um, and I must have had a lot to drink that morning because about halfway across the bay, maybe we were 30 minutes into the journey and it was another 30 minutes to go, I really needed to pee. So I'm kind of sitting there, it's a bit awkward, and I'm like, I don't really know these people very well. And we finally get to a lock and I'm like, yes, yes, so I run over to the edge. And so Werner and Tom and his wife and these people, they're all laughing at me. And I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna go. I just got, and I got stage fright. So I had to crawl back into the boat, <laughs> sit down beside these basic heroes of mine. Um, and I didn't get to pee until much later. But we all became friends and both Werner and Tom ultimately were part of the investment round. <laughs> so this year, 2019, um, Toward the end of the year, we brought in what I think is our best customer ever. Um, it's C2 Montreal, which is a creative and commercial conference in Canada. And I really like them as a customer because they're not directly related to any of the people from the FunConf or the OOL or the, the network there. They, they sort of feel to me like they came to us for the product we are, I think it was a, effectively a, a marketing play. They didn't know anything about us, but they like what we do, they like our philosophy, and they believed that we were going to deliver for them. Um, and to me, that feels like a real success. Um, the other thing then that came out of admission was one of the last speakers was a woman called Kim Creighton. She's an activist and a blogger and a podcaster from Atlanta. And on the back of what we did at admission, basically created a, a space that she felt safe in. She wanted to work with us to be a model company to try and improve tech. Her goal in tech is to redefine capitalism without white supremacy. So it's quite a lofty goal, um, but she wanted to work with us to at least become, to lay the groundwork for being a model company for, for that kind of um, ambition. So we worked with Kim, um, and we've been working with her as a business coach, and she's helped us establish our core values of integrity, of excellence and of delight. And so it's given us a framework through which to make decisions objectively rather than subjectively. And it's been really interesting for me to learn. And one of the challenges she gave to me last week was essentially, how can I use my network to improve the lives of marginalized people? And it's a question that I'm, I'm really struggling with and I know that I can make a difference and I'm really, I really feel that I need to have a good answer for that question. And so it's, it's one that I want to share with you, is like how can we use the network that we all um, have to, to help marginalized people have the opportunities that we all have. Um, the final thing that we're doing this year is at the start of the year, uh, I was asking Tom a question about hiring when you're bootstrapped and you've run out of money. Um, and he said, if you're ever interested in raising more money, then I would be interested. So 
Uh, a couple of weeks later, I was meeting with our rep from Enterprise Ireland, and I said, would you be interested? And he said, yes, we'd be very interested, because I think something like only 20% of Enterprise Ireland customers make it to a million in revenue, and we did it a year early. So uh, we're, going to do, we, we're going to do it again. Tom asked me this time, which he didn't ask me the first time, was how am I going to get my money out? And I was like, I don't know. But I had seen IndyVC, um, Independent Venture Capital, it's Tom, Tim O'Reilly's uh, venture fund, where there's an escape hatch, there's an escape clause. After three years, you can get your money back at 2x, or five years, you can get it back at 3x. So IndyVC, I contacted those folks, and they weren't, they weren't going to take us on, um, because we weren't a good fit for a number of reasons. But I went to our legal firm, and they drew up a set of terms loosely modeled on IndyVC. And basically what it allows us to do is defer the decision making um, of whether we want to sell or however we want to exit down the line. And there's a, an escape, escape hatch for both investors and founders about whether we want to pursue profitability in the future. So I'm really excited about that. And that's all happening um, at the moment. And I'm kind of working through that. So there's my, uh, my summary. Of, of lessons, I guess, um, if you want to look at those and if you have any questions about them. And then just I have a little lightning talk just to, to wrap up about what I want to do next based on what I've learned. Um, first of all, I literally want to shape up. Um, I want to read the book, Shape Up, the Basecamp book, Shape Up, and I want to get rid of this stupid three-year release cycle or, or 12 months release cycle that we accidentally got it ourselves into. Um, I want to release things every every two months, I want to do six week cycles and two weeks off. I want to do all that. I want to get us into a pattern where we're shipping cupcakes rather than giant releases that kill us. Um, uh, I also, in terms of shaping up, um, I read April Dunford's book through Jane. Jane's basically, everyone should talk to Jane before the, the day is out. <laughs> um, and we did a whole positioning project with her and I think that was amazing. Um, I want to be more values driven. I've learned the power of values and the, the power of being able to make decisions through the lens of values and not just gut feeling. Um, we did all these five, six years based on our gut that we wanted to be good, but actually we had these core values that all we needed to do was pin down. And at the same token, we want to be more intentional in the sense that intentional defined as what we want versus what we get. We want to try and align those as closely as possible. And then lastly, in this little bit, I want to continuously check myself in the sense that every day for the last seven years, I've asked myself, is this what I want to do? Tom asked me, what would you be doing if you wasn't Tito? And I'd be like, Something probably looks exactly like Tito. Um, and until I, have a, 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 until I have the wrong answer for that, I, I intend to keep, keep going. Um, we care so much about our values and living our values. Um, we take things personally, maybe less so now than we did at the start, but it still sucks to, when someone leaves like a zero or a one NPS. And at the same token, although we've made so many mistakes, I'm really quite proud of what we've done. It's been so hard. Some of it has been so hard, but ultimately, like we just decided to go out. We wanted to build an independent, sustainable, profitable business. And we've taken a roundabout course, but we got there. Um, my family always comes first, and we've designed our business to put family first. We have kind of, if you're feeling shit days, or if you need to look after your kid days, that's just, that's just a given. And um, we know that not everybody has a family or wants a family, and we need to respect that too. But we do, and this is what we're, we're optimizing for that. I'm just looking after ourselves. I go to the gym twice a week. I want to live a, as long, a healthy life as I possibly can. And I want to have an independent company that backs me to live that kind of life. And there really is nothing I'd rather be doing. Although there is one. I'd like to get to two million, and I hope it doesn't take seven years.